Welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to see all of these different generations of series students, alumni, uh, and faculty here. Thank you all for coming to celebrate series 60th anniversary. Um, I would like to recognize Harley Bolter, the former director, sitting over there. We're glad to have you back. I know a number of you when you were in the program. He was a director, and I also want to recognize two former associate directors, Jennifer Long, over there, <laughs> and Benjamin Loring. So, welcome all back. And of course, I really am very happy to welcome again President Alexander Krushnevsky. For those of you who celebrated the 50th anniversary of series, he was with us then, and we're just delighted that he's come back. I should tell you this is his second trip to Georgetown in a week. Uh, he Last Saturday, we were all part of a conference commemorating the fall of the wall. He went back to Warsaw and came back here, so that's real devotion uh, to series. He, I know, really was very much looking forward to uh, seeing you. So here we are in Washington, D.C. today, and there's nothing going on, right? It's just very quiet for those of you who don't live here and uh, left. You know, there's nothing happening here, just a few things on television. Um, so I think we're looking forward to a very lively discussion this afternoon. Again, we have people from different generations who graduated from RASP and series at different times, so we wanted to showcase um, them. Um, hopefully the words quid pro quo will not be mentioned here. Um, I don't think they um, are part of our discussion. Um, and I'll just tell you one story about President Kwasniewski before I introduce him. Um, when he was here as a distinguished visiting professor, and I'm talking about a decade ago now, um, he invited myself and my family, we were in Warsaw, to a very interesting dinner. Uh, we had General Jaruzelski there. Uh, we had Adam Rotfeld, former foreign minister. We had various um, other distinguished people there. Fascinating discussion. And I think it really taught me if you think about the complexities just of Polish history and Polish politics, people have obviously very different views sitting together and having a civilized discussion. Uh, I would say we could learn from that here. So I remember that very vividly. Poland's changed as well. <laughs> Poland's changed as well. <laughs> It's not as civilized now. OK, well, maybe it was your legacy was still greater then because it was shortly after you were president. So um, President Alexander Kwasniewski was president of Poland from 1995 to 2005. Uh, and then after that, he was a distinguished scholar uh, in the practice of global leadership at Georgetown. And for those of you were in, who were in the program there, you know that he came. Um, he gave various lectures. We had many conferences with him. Um, before um, the change in Poland, um, he was a minister of the government of Poland from 1985 uh, to 1990. He was also the head of the Olympic uh, Committee then. He has a, uh, an athletic past, too. Um, he was the co-author of the Polish constitution that was adopted in 1997. Um, he was also the only president of Poland in modern Poland who was re-elected um, uh, to office. Um, he was instrumental in making sure in, in that Poland joined NATO and then later on the European Union. Those were two of his signal accomplishments. Um, he was, he's also always been a great supporter of Ukraine, of an independent Ukraine. Um, he was a mediator uh, during the time of the Orange Revolution. Uh, uh, and then also he's been instrumental since 2014 um, in, in working with Ukraine um, in this very difficult situation. Um, and he, of course, was also the author of numerous initiatives um, for reconciliation between Poles and Germans, Poles and Jews, Poland, Poles and Ukrainians. So he worked very hard uh, in all of those spheres. Um, and um, he's on numerous boards now. He's obviously still uh, making important speeches. And I think uh, was ju just uh, after the recent elections in Poland, uh, the party that he uh, headed was is back in the parliament. Anyway, please join me in welcoming President Kwasniewski. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, dear Professor Stent, uh, I'm very privileged to be here, uh, especially 
uh, for such extraordinary occasion, 60th anniversary of um, Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies. That's true that I've been in Washington some days ago and I went to Poland, but it was really an uh, important reason of that because um, uh, 12th of the, the November we inaugurated uh, the parliament, uh, the same and Senate, and after four years of such very dominant role of um, uh, Mr. Kaczynski party, law and justice, uh, after this election we have a little bit more balanced situation in my country, because uh, in the second chamber is Senate, we have a different majority as in same. So I am sure that um, this four years, which uh, we open uh, last days, will be much more balanced for Poland. And this time of such tough revolution, let's say, is, is finished. Of course, Kaczynski will lead the country, but without comfort. And that is uh, maybe not uh, very great news, but that is something what, what we achieved. And Poland is before presidential election, May next year. And of course, uh, I can uh, imagine that in the second round of this election, we'll have a really uh, historical fight between uh, Kaczynski's camp and incumbent President Duda, who is a man of Kaczynski, with uh, the person uh, representing the opposition in Poland. And chances today, frankly speaking, of course the incumbent president is a favorite of this um, competition, but the chances are 50-50, maybe 51 for, for, for the law and justice and, and 49 for the opposition, but still that is an open, uh, open situation. So I uh, came back to Washington much more optimistic. Um, about Poland, and I watched today um, the hearings of former uh, American ambassador to Ukraine, uh, and I'm less optimistic uh, now. Um, but uh, I want to say some words about um, series. Uh, uh, I congratulate you your achievements in these uh, 60 years. Uh, I want to uh, congratulate Professor Stent. We spent uh, extremely nice for me and interesting time, 2006, 2010, almost five years, almost one term of presidency in Poland. Um, uh, and I tell you uh, that in my life, uh, I had very few bosses. And she is one of the, this few and the best boss. Of course, I don't, I don't speak about my wife. The different. That is absolutely different story. She's boss forever. But but Angela was really fantastic boss, and I thank you very much for, for everything what you have done for me and for your friendship. It was it was really great. I'm very grateful for the series because uh, this proposal to be visiting professor he came to me in the last months of my presidency. Uh, when really, uh, the, 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 after 10 years, uh, you have such feeling of, of, of vacuum. Uh, you know that it's necessary to change your life, but you don't know how difficult is this change. Um, uh, of course, I remember such famous sentence of Madeleine Albright. Uh, she said once that she recognized finally that she's not uh, Secretary of State, that she went to the car and no, no driver was there. And, um, uh, and of course, um, uh, but that is, that's a serious problem, but not the, 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 the biggest one. I think um, uh, really to find some interesting activity after presidency, it was uh, not easy, but I found it thanks uh, Georgetown University. And, and uh, I tell you, for me, it was very, very refreshing. It was very, very interesting. I remember sometimes the questions uh, of the students uh, and my first impression was, well, my God, that's so naive question. Uh, but after some minutes, I understood, no, it wasn't naive because uh, in such daily job, you know, as a president, uh, very often you don't think about these fundamental questions, fundamental issues. So I'm very grateful for this, um, uh, for this time uh, because uh, I spent um, fascinating uh, uh, weeks uh, and months here, and then um, I met a um, uh, very interesting person, and uh, I want to greet all of you who I met uh, during these um, five years. Uh, I'm very grateful to the students for this difficult, sometimes naive, but in fact difficult questions, because they opened my mind for some new perspectives. And uh, last, uh, what I want to say about this uh, uh, period in my life, life, that it was psychologically uh, very important as well. 
uh, during this Georgetown uh, period, I met several times President Clinton, and we tried to describe what it means to be former president mm -hmm. and how to describe our feelings. And we found, I think, very right definition of that. That is such mixture of liberation and frustration. Liberation, why? Because finally we want to do what we want to do. Um, we, we do what we want to do. Uh, we say what we want to say. We, we can meet what, who we want to meet. And that is a fantastic feeling of such really full liberation. And why frustration? Well, because unfortunately it's necessary to watch our successors. And that's the problem. And I think that President Obama is fully agree with our definition of, um, uh, um, of uh, former, former president. So this, uh, this, this uh, psychological uh, factor was also extremely uh, valuable and important for me. And again, thank you very much for all of you who helped me, who invited me, who created such a nice atmosphere in this, in this uh, time. Then, uh, of course, uh, I should speak here about uh, Russia, European Union, Ukraine, all these um, uh, problems. Uh, it's a long story, but I will try to tell you some main points which, in my opinion, are uh, important to, to understand. Of course, this is my subjective uh, opinion. I'm, I'm uh, speaking uh, as, a, as a Polish politician, as a Polish former president, as a man who was very much involved in all this um, uh, issues because uh, since the independence of Ukraine, I was very close with Ukraine. I was close as a leader of the Social Democratic Party of Poland, which I um, uh, established at the beginning of the 90s. Uh, then uh, I was, as a president, uh, very much involved in this process of uh, good uh, uh, relations uh, between us, uh, reconciliation between Poles and Ukrainians, what is not easy. Um, uh, task because the history was uh, really very complicated, especially the history of 20th century between our countries. And then as a president, what uh, Professor Stent mentioned, I was a uh, negotiator during uh, Orange Revolution. Uh, we found this solution for this uh, um, um, uh, problem with this frankly speaking, not very constitutional idea of third round of presidential election, but what happened and then President Yushchenko won and, and, and was elected as a president. Then in the years 2012 and 13, um, together with former uh, president of European Parliament, Pat Cox from Ireland, we were special envoys of European Parliament to support um, the Ukrainian efforts to, to sign association agreement with the European Union and to release political prisoners. Um, among these political prisoners uh, was uh, Yuri Lutsenko, the next uh, general prosecutor of, um, of, of, of uh, Ukraine, and uh, the name which is very, very, let's say, uh, popular now in Washington. Um, uh, and of course, uh, I'm still close to, 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 to Ukraine. I'm a chairman of the board of Yalta European Strategy Conference, one of the best European conferences uh, uh, so that is the next reason um, uh, of, of my, uh, of, of why I, I feel myself as, as a quite competent to speak about uh, these problems. Uh, of course, uh, during my second term as a president, I met several times President Putin as well. Um, uh, I had very good conversations with uh, him. But frankly speaking, uh, when I recall Putin those times, I have to say that it was Putin number one. And today we have a Putin, even not number two, I think this is a Putin number three or number four. So this is a different different person. Of course, uh, the main division line between us um, was created during Orange Revolution because our positions were absolutely different. But that is the next reason why, please understand, from such subjective point of view, I want to say something about all these um, um, uh, problems. But before that, um, I want to say something what, uh, what uh, I want to explain to you, because uh, now, especially this year, we have 20th anniversary of Polish, not only Polish, but the membership of Poland, Hungary, and uh, Czech Republic, NATO. And uh, I read, or I heard, a lot of such opinions that this NATO enlargement was the biggest mistake of the West, of the United States, 
because uh, it creates this atmosphere of lack of trust and uh, and we have now all these consequences of this decision of um, of enlargement and uh, in my opinion that is absolutely uh, wrong uh, this decision was in my opinion a historical one and uh, very useful and of course, if you want to discuss this issue of NATO enlargement uh, in the end of uh, last century, you know, end of 90s, it's necessary to understand all these international and um, uh, conditions, circumstances, uh, also in, in our region. Because uh, today, to discuss after 20 years what would be better to do 20 years um, ago, that is a little bit uh, historical. And, um, uh, I want to tell you such story, which uh, sounds like a joke, but is not a joke. That is a true story, uh, and uh, you should. I want to 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 tell you how to we, uh, from from our Central European perspective or Polish perspective, uh, understood this necessity of of NATO membership. It was the year 1997, and Mikhail Gorbachev was awarded by very famous, the best Polish weekly magazine, Politica. Um, by some uh, award, uh, I participated in the celebrations, and uh, of course uh, Gorbachev had such strong speech against NATO, against NATO enlargement, etc. And next morning, I invited him to to the breakfast, and we had the breakfast. And because I knew his position about NATO, I decided not to discuss NATO, but to discuss other things because I would like to create good atmosphere for such beginning of the day for the breakfast. So I asked, of course, we spoke in Russian, it was only one-on-one -on -one meeting, and I asked Mikhail Sergeyevich, tell me, please, uh, something about Russia, what is in Russia? And Gorbachev said, disaster, disaster. You know, enough, the, all institutions are destroyed, the, the, the state doesn't uh, work, the, the, everything is stolen, the factories are stolen, disaster, okay. And tell me something about Russian army. Oh, disaster, disaster. You know, everything is stolen. The generals, they don't control the situation. Probably nuclear weapon is stolen as well. Disaster. And tell me, please, about your successor, President Yeltsin. Disaster, absolutely disaster. He doesn't understand the situation. He is not sober. You know, he is absolutely making wrong things, etc. Disaster. And then we finished this breakfast. I said, Mikhail Sergeyevich, I'm sorry, we didn't discuss such serious issues like NATO. Oh, very good, Alexander, that you mentioned NATO. Why you want to go to NATO? Why? Then I said. Mr. Gorbachev, after everything what you said about Russia, Russian army, Yeltsin, I'm running to my desk and will call to Clinton to accept us as a member of NATO immediately, <laughs> immediately. And I tell you, that is a real story. That was the, the picture of the situation at the end of 90s. And the alternative for Central European countries, for Poland, was not to be NATO member or to be neutral country. Neutrality was good during Cold War. It was very useful for such countries as Finland or Austria. But neutrality at the end of the 90s was absolutely unrealistic approach. So for us, this NATO membership was alternative to stay in some kind of gray zone. And in my opinion, if America wouldn't be enough courageous as Clinton's and Clinton himself and Clinton's administration was those times, especially Madeleine Albright. And Madeleine Albright, Madeleine Albright was very, very useful because she was born in Czechoslovakia. She knew this situation so, so well. I tell you that the, the future of the region would be much worse because probably we would be in some kind of gray zone until now. And in my opinion, this situation um, could create a lot of, of tensions, a lot of uh, conflicts, a lot of um, uncertainty, I don't know what more. So in my opinion, enlargement of NATO was uh, really the great decision of, um, of, of the West, the great decision of the United States. And if you see consequences of this enlargement, stability, peace, in this region of, of, um, of, of the world, in this region of Europe, I think that is enough strong evidence to say that all these alternative ideas, neutrality or some kind of gray zone, were much, much more worse and um, uh, more uh, uh, dangerous. And then, of course, is necessary to understand as well that um, uh, after this uh, enlargement, uh, America and the West offered to, the, to Russia uh, several times this idea of reset. 
but um, it was uh, and it was uh, official position of, of Hillary Clinton. I remember it in the year 2009 in Geneva. She offered this reset bottom to to Lavrov. Then Obama repeated this this concept of reset. But this reset idea was never fully accepted by uh, by Russia. And now is a good question: Why Russia is not interested to? To, to make such reset politics um, uh, vis vis-a-vis -vis, uh, NATO. And in my opinion, it is um, uh, important to understand this Russian politics. I repeat again, that is my, my point of view, my position. I think, especially this Putin, num because Putin, number one, still was quite interested to have a closer relationship with the, with the West. He tried to, to, to keep this, this uh, context. Um, but then the politics um, uh, changed very much. And today, I think, from a strategic point of view, Putin has two main goals. The first goal is uh, to rebuild the position of Russia as uh, one of the main players on global stage. And he is successful in this, uh, in this job to some extent. If you see Syria, if you see some other places, uh, in my opinion, he plays even over his cards, uh, and he has some, some successes, but that is, sorry, that is one of the main, uh, one of the main two uh, topics of his, of his presidency, uh, especially in this period when uh, architecture of the geopolitics in the world is changing, when we have a new role of China, when we have some big ambitions from, from, from India, etc., when we have uh, problems uh, inside European Union and United States. Um, so I think that is very, very strong uh, motivation of his of his um, um, uh, activity of his presidency, rebuild this position of Russia as a, as a global player. The second is to rebuild some kind of zone of influence. Uh, of course, that's, uh, uh, Putin is very far away of this ideological uh, concept of, of Soviet Union, etc. But um, this uh, idea of Great Russia is very close to his heart. And this uh, Great Russia uh, means uh, the zone of influence, at least in the frames of uh, Russia, Tsarist Russia, or Soviet Union. Probably not so much with Baltic states, because the history of Baltic states is a little bit different. They were part of, um, of um, uh, Soviet Union not so long time before the, uh, together with the, with the beginning of Second World War. But uh, this idea of Great Russia, and I spoke with, with, with Yeltsin, that is not, that is my, my imagination only, that is some, some our conversation. Uh, so he wants to see in this, let's say, not empire, because this is too, strong, too much to say empire, but in this great Russia concept, first of all, Ukraine, secondly, Moldova, then all three Caucasus states, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and, um, um, and uh, Armenia, and Central Asian republics. In Central Asian republics, uh, he is enough patient because he is looking what will happen after the end of uh, legacy of uh, uh, fathers of these republics. So now we have uh, the new, a little bit new situation in Kazakhstan. We have absolutely new situation in Uzbekistan. But I think still in the concept of uh, Putin, this idea to keep all these all these um, countries uh, uh, in such zone of Russian influence is is a crucial one. Is one of the main main driving force of his um, of his um, uh, presidency, uh, and that is important to understand because if that is a real goal of um, Putin, it means that such conflicts like Russian Ukraine conflict is a not short. Conflict or the conflict for short time is, is a long-lasting conflict, um, uh, but I will say something more uh, later on. So that is point number one, this strategy of Putin. Point number two is um, um, uh, this in political internal sphere. And the main goal of Putin is consolidating power through limiting the scope of democracy, freedom of speeches, um, uh, rule of law. Um, 
he is very nervous because they uh, learned very well the lessons of uh, so-called color revolutions in Georgia and, um, and uh, Ukraine. And uh, they are very nervous if they see, especially in Ukraine, uh, such positive um, developments. Because, frankly speaking, for this idea of, of Putin, this great Russian, the most dangerous would be the real success of democratic Ukraine. Because, uh, you know, the successes of post-socialist uh, countries like Poland, that is okay, but that is not real. These this successes, they have not a real impact on Russian situation, because we were different from the very beginning. We, all these countries like Czechoslovakia, or Czechia, Slovakia, Hungary, Poland, were much more westernized uh, than, uh, than uh, Ukraine. And of course, to have such success of democracy, uh, the uh, rule of laws, um, effective market economy um, uh, and good relations with, with the West, that is uh, something what, what really can be the model for many people, especially young generation in Russia. And um, I have some evidence for that because uh, after 14 years I was invited, we were again together with Angel Stand in Moscow and uh, during one of the conferences, Primakov's lecture, and um, after this, I was invited by students of very prestigious uh, uh, Russian high school, Mgimo. And they asked me, first of all, about Ukraine. And uh, I was afraid that uh, they will have such uh, a picture of Ukraine very much uh, painted by Russian propaganda. But not. They were extremely interested about Zelensky, who is Zelensky, what they are doing, uh, and this new generation. They have a chance um, for success or not. And it was very, very honest interest uh, to see that something is possible. And, and, and Mgimo students, so that's, that's his, and I think it was a meeting with 40, 50 persons, so I'm sure that we were not alone, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and they were enough brave to ask me about all the things with such Huge interest, and maybe that is the way. That is something what we can what we can repeat in Russia. This uh, with new generation, new new thinking, and and of course, uh, in my opinion, this uh, consolidation of power and elimination on all such uh, temptations to be more Ukrainians in sense of politics. Um, that is something what is a real danger for uh, for Putin economically. Of course, Putin speaks a lot about modernization, and he understands very well that modernization is absolutely needed for, uh, for Russia. But the problem is that he understands modernization in a very special sense, as a, such administrative modernization, modernization um, uh, led by um, uh, the center, and modernization which uh, I can say is uh, very authoritarian. And, and that is not enough. And that is not enough because um, today Russia and the system, economic system of Russia is some kind of hybrid between Soviet time, Yeltsin time, and Putin's time. And uh, we have a lot of um, 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 uh, such uh, um, uh, institutions which, which cannot be effective because uh, they, are, uh, they are not uh, prepared to, 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 to answer the challenges of, of new era. Uh, for example, um, you know, the, everybody knows in Russia that the main group of decision makers is Putin and his team. But the, this team, they have no constitutional responsibility. Because still, the constitutional responsibility is on the side of the government and the ministers. And everybody knows in Russia that the ministers, they have constitutional responsibility, but they have not enough power. The same with um, regions. Russia needs uh, decentralization. This huge country, of course, this decentralization should be very clever because it's necessary to keep this integrity from one side and, and decentralization from other, but uh, they need to, 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 to create much more um, uh, energy and use this energy which is among the citizens on this uh, regional level. And of course, if Russia, and Russia today is, of course, uh, the country with the biggest territory in the world, with nuclear weapon, with uh, huge and well-equipped um, army, but without real position on the global markets. When I ask Russians, tell me what is your best good, what you can export, they still 
speak about new, uh, some weapons, uh, vodka, what is not serious answer, of course, uh, and that's it. Even in 60s, Russia had some advantage in some elements like, like uh, uh, cosmic researchers, uh, etc., in some uh, uh, elements. Today, today, Russia has a main problem. What should be such place of Russia on, in, 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 global, in the global economy? And of course, uh, it's difficult to predict that uh, Putin in his next term, last term, we don't know, uh, will modernize this country because he knows that Russia needs this modernization very much. But he and especially the people surrounding him, they are not, not only prepared for that, but also are not interested about it. And the next um, uh, important proof of that is uh, in Russia, if you ask about reformers, if you ask about the people who uh, can be the leaders of this uh, serious modernization, deep modernization, the modernization not only of some branches of the industry, of, of the economy, but modernization of the state, such two names which are mentioned, only two, is Gref, Hermann Gref, and Alexei Kudrin. And if you see what these guys are doing now, that is the answer how much Putin is interested about this deep modernization. Because Gref is still, of course, he's the CEO of the biggest uh, Russian bank, but that's his only bank. He's not a minister or, or, or prime minister. And Kudrin, who was deputy prime minister, today he's a chairman of audit office, uh, something like that. To say that he's on the margin is not enough to say. That, that, that it means that really Russia uh, has a problem with this um, uh, modernization. On the level of military uh, reforms, uh, of course, um, uh, Russia um, developed very much these uh, this, um, uh, capabilities. Uh, and uh, that is still one of the main elements of um, uh, Putin's politics. But uh, uh, if we understand this first strategic goal to be, again, a global player, that we can understand it, but for the modernization for, of the country to create this real, real uh, strength and, uh, in, 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 in front of new challenges, that is not, uh, uh, not enough. Uh, and then, of course, external policy, that is something what uh, Putin is doing quite uh, well. But he has in this politics uh, still these main strategic goals uh, in his um, mind. And uh, for example, and now I want to say something more about this uh, relations with European Union. The problem with European Union for Putin is uh, uh, complicated, but not very serious in my opinion. Because from the very beginning, Russia, uh, Putin's Russia doesn't believe that European Union can survive. I think even psychologically, I've heard many times such argument that all unions, they cannot survive. And that is a little bit such resentment of the collapse of Soviet Union. And because Soviet Union collapse, European Union will collapse. This is a question only when. I think the situation of European Union is not so bad. I, I am sure that it will survive. But because of such understanding of European Union, the politics of um, uh, of uh, Russian politics towards EU was very special. I call it as a politics 28 plus 1, or twi now after uh, the Brexit, 27 plus 1. What means? That for Russia, European Union still, that is a 27 or 28 bilateral relationships with each EU member. With some of members, these relations are very privileged. For example, Italy, especially during Berlusconi time, uh, with Germany so before, before Merkel, uh, now with Macron. And, uh, and with some countries, they are not good, Baltic states. And with some countries, are, are quite frozen. The good example is Poland. And this plus one, that is uh, the relations of Russia to Brussels, all these European institutions. And European institutions are not treated by Russians seriously. That is much more the routine of the contacts as the real substance of, of this context. But we Europeans, we should know that that is politics not for today, but that is 
long-term strategy of, um, uh, of Russia. Uh, Russia understands very well that the main problems and the main competitors are coming from two sides, United States and, um, and China. And in this European, um, uh, on this European field, they are passive, that is probably not, but they are not very, very, very active. But they try to use this, um, this um, uh, uh, let's say, tricky diplomacy um, uh, very much. Um, uh, uh, now, European Union uh, made a big surprise for uh, Russia and for Putin uh, after Ukrainian war, because uh, Putin absolutely didn't expect that the reaction of European Union will be so united and so long-lasting, because um, he was absolutely sure that uh, 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 such countries as, as Spain or, 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 or Italy, they will not accept such strong sanctions or even not strong, even some kinds of sanctions against, against um, Russia, it will, but it happened. And then, of course, uh, first of all, thanks Angela Merkel, because she is still the strongest uh, um, uh, supporters of this uh, sanctioned politics, uh, they, uh, they exist, uh, the sanctions exist. But uh, Putin tries again and again, and he will try to do next uh, years uh, again, to, to fragment European Union, to find special privileged partners and, uh, in, 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 uh, in European Union. And now probably is, is necessary to say some words about the last statement of uh, President Macron. Um, you know for sure this um, uh, interview to The Economist. And um, uh, I tell you, in some elements I'm close to Macron's thinking, but in some, some elements I, I'm not. First, it's necessary to understand why Macron decided to make such proposals. First, of course, this is a long French uh, history, because the France tries to play some special role in, inside NATO and European Union from the very beginning. Uh, and, and I know very well this, this French position, because I was working closely with late Jacques Chirac. Um, um, we were 10 years together in the office. Uh, and it was time of our negotiations about NATO and European Union. And I understood finally the problems with, with um, France, because uh, if France has uh, not arguments and has not uh, chance to, 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 to say something serious about the problem, that the last strongest argument is, no, we cannot do it because, because la grandeur de la France, greatness of France. You know, you know, when you hear such arguments, what to say, you know? I cannot say that we can, we should do it because the greatness of Poland, you know, something like that, that, that sounds, <laughs> sounds not good. Uh, but but that, is, that, that is a problem with, with French, uh, French politics. Uh, after 10 years of my, my, he was a very good colleague, Jacques Chirac, and, and on such personal level, he was one of the, the, the nicest person who I met. But I realized finally the secret of, of Jacques Chirac, and now I can tell you the secret, that I realized that during the first term of Chirac, he understood that he is the best son of the Gaul, because he was from the Gaullist movement. But in the second term, he, rea he realized finally that he is the father of the Gaul. And it was, <laughs> it was more complicated, <laughs> because to speak with, let's say, father of the Gaul was, was really, uh, really difficult. But, okay. Um, uh, now Macron. So Macron's thinking is a little bit connected with this La Grandeur de la France, the understanding of the special role of, 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 of France. But I think today this um, um, ideas of Macron is necessary to understand to, as a fight for the leadership in European Union in very, very special situation today. Because this first special situation means first Brexit, and without the um, United Kingdom, France is only European country, member of the European Union with nuclear weapon. No more. And second, Angela Merkel decided to finish her time in next year. Yeah? 
So it means that on the position of the leader of, of Europe, the real leader of the Europe, I don't speak about these institutional leaders from Brussels, we have, we have um, um, some kind of, of a new game. And, and, but that I can understand. As a politician, I understand that Macron wants, he's a young man, he wants to use these opportunities and he wants to uh, create himself as, as a new leader of this um, uh, European community, and he has also uh, arguments for that. But what is close to my thinking and what is uh, uh, and about what uh, I'm very much afraid, I think his opinion that European Union today, because of new politics of United States, has to change this uh, uh, especially these military factors, and to think much more about own security and own military forces and everything what, what uh, we need as a, as a EU is, is correct. Because in my opinion, in long term, we Europeans, we should be prepared that these transatlantic ties in American politics will be weaker and not stronger. And that is not only because of Trump's presidency, because I think this process started before, started with Obama. But that is the result, in my opinion, of the changing of the structure of the society in the United States. We have less and less these people with European or, let's say, transatlantic roots. We have more and more people with Latin American roots, Chinese or Asian roots. And I think the structure of, of um, American society, first of all, will create new leaders much more connected with other parts of the world, not transatlantic um, sphere. And secondly, I think in this American, um, uh, in the global politics, especially vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, that is not good, but I'm realistic. I think it will happen so. Uh, the role of this transatlantic tie is still important for the United States, still very important for American interest uh, uh, in the world, but will be weaker, not stronger. In such sense, I understand that Macron is, is right, and if we will spend this 2% of GDP um, for military expenditures, what we decided before Trump, is necessary to say, this decision was before, it was during Obama presidency, uh, so it's necessary to use this huge amount of money for better preparation of military capability of, um, uh, of Europe to organize better cooperation between uh, military uh, defense industry and, and, and companies, etc., cetera, uh, et cetera. And what um, um, fears me in uh, Macron's speech is this idea of this, let's say, reset uh, with Russia, because Macron, I understand uh, his words uh, following, he proposed this, um, uh, uh, this, this reset, this new relation with Russia, what I'm not against. I'm sure that Europe needs good relations with Russia, but he is ready to pay the price of, this, uh, of such countries as, as Ukraine, Moldova, and others uh, to leave them in such kind of gray zone. And that is extremely dangerous, because it means that the chances for democratic forces in these countries, for, um, for the people, for the young generation, will be very, very uh, limited. I think that bef before the uh, interview to the economies, Macron uh, decided about something what is uh, uh, evidence of, of such type of thinking. He say veto for um, uh, European Union enlargement um, uh, to Macedonia and... Um, uh, one second. No, no, Macedonia, this Balkans. I, I, no, Albania, 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 Albania. So, and I think it was a, it was a very, very bad decision. In my opinion, it was in the last uh, uh, years of European Union history. Brexit was a tragic decision, but this uh, decision to postpone uh, for I don't know how long in my opinion, for a very, very long time, this membership of first Balkans countries, that is, that is um, a big mistake as well. But it's necessary to understand that Macron said what he said, and we have some new partner uh, for, for Putin, for Russia, to discuss uh, all these um, issues with some very, very real costs, especially on, on um, uh, Ukrainian, uh, on Ukrainian side. So, European Union, of course, uh, uh, had some problems in the last years, and the activity of European Union was not enough 
strong, especially vis-à-vis -vis, uh, eastern part of of, um, uh, of Europe. But uh, I'm very, I'm still optimistic, and I'm, I'm sure that even if the Brexit finally happened, we'll see. But it looks so that to happen, it will be a big mistake. First of all, big mistake of Great Britain, but also not good for, for European Union. But then we will observe some kind of consolidation of European Union. Because in Europe, especially if you see results of uh, last um, European election, we were very much afraid that the populists can uh, have a fantastic result. Finally, the populists had good result, but not fantastic. These pro-European uh, forces, pro-European parties uh, have a enough strong majority in Europe. So I think the consolidation of European Union is possible. Um, uh, Europe has enough potential, intellectual potential, economic potential, also military potential, to be the player and especially the leaders of Europe, they should understand and I hope they will understand that in this 21st century, when this new architecture of the world is, 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 is changing, if we want to play the role in the world together with China, United States, Russia, etc., we should be united. That no one European country, even Germany, the strongest one, they have no chances at all to be such players in this new new era of um, of the world and i hope that finally uh, the, the main forces or the forces of mainstream in europe will understand it and they will consolidate this european uh, efforts and 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 if they will do it and i think it will happen soon uh, the question how to manage these relations with russia will be uh, again the crucial and if we want to manage this or to create new kind of relations with Russia, it's necessary to say something about Ukraine. Because the Ukraine today is a main point of division, is a main point of polarization of the position, and uh, looks not good, because we don't see positive solutions for this conflict, which started not only uh, 2014, together with the war, but is from the very beginning of independent uh, of the uh, independent uh, Ukraine. And now, Russia and Ukraine. I think the Russia, what I said before, they want to have Ukraine in the zone, own zone of influence, and they want to. They don't think about Crimea only. Crimea, that is done, unfortunately. But uh, that is not enough for them to have a, uh, in Donetsk and Lugansk and impact on these eastern regions. So that is not enough. They want to have a Ukraine as as, as entire Ukraine. Uh, especially historically, they have a strong sentiments for that because you know the beginning of this great Russia started uh, in uh, Kiev, not in in Moscow, not in. Uh, other places, the cradle of Great Russia is, is uh, Kiev's Rus, and, and therefore, you know, to to to, to uh, imagine that this Great Russia can be without Ukraine, that is difficult. Uh, that is the second. That is the first point. The second is a big mistake, and I think this mistake is uh, is uh, still very strong, uh, strongly in the uh, Putin's mind, and, and not only many of Russians they think in the same way that Ukrainians they are in fact the Russians. And, and, that, and that is something what is not true from the very beginning. So Ukrainians, they have really own identity, language, culture, etc. They try to be independent several times, unsuccessfully. The Ukrainian statehood existed for short periods of time in, in, in 20th century, in 17th century, etc. But this identity is, is a fact. And so what is a great paradox of today, that this identity of Ukraine now is much stronger as it was 10 or 20 years ago. And if some who will write a book about Ukraine identity should dedicate at least one or two chapters for one of the fathers of Ukraine identity, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. <laughs> because everything what Putin has done against Ukraine, uh, all statements about Ukraine, the war in, uh, in Donetsk, Lugansk, this illegal annexation of Crimea, created unbelievable eruption, explosion of this Ukrainian identity, especially among young generations. 
I had a lot of lectures in, in, in um, the Ukrainian universities, through, especially as a former president, and normally I was um, speaking um, uh, Russian. After 2014, these same rectors in the same universities, they asked me to speak not Russian. I said, oh my God, I, I understand Ukrainian, but I'm not prepared to speak in Ukrainian. So what language? English. OK, I can speak English, but they will understand more or less. So and now for Ukrainians, it's better to understand more or less English and 100% Russian. And that is, a, that is a symbol of change. This is a symbol of this, this increasing um, uh, identity and national, and national pride um, uh, as well. So the second big mistake is to treat Ukrainians as a hohols, as a, these young Russians or these not so well developed Russians. I think that is, that is, um, uh, that is something what what is wrong and, and um, uh, cannot create some, some place for, for, for agreement, for some, some uh, deal or cooperation. And third point, which is also wrong in, in the Russian understanding of Ukraine, is still the uh, such feeling that Ukraine is not a state and they are not prepared to be independent sovereign state. And of course, because sometimes Ukraine show that they are ready to be sovereign independent. The Russians, they try to destroy these feelings and this situation, and therefore this destabilization of Ukraine, of Ukraine and Ukrainian politics is one of the main elements of Russian politics in the last 30 years. In my opinion, such favorite scenario of Putin towards um, uh, Ukraine would be uh, one day destabilized Ukraine, bad economy, a lot of uh, social tensions, uh, exhausted people, tired people, and finally they will vote for some pro-Russian forces, pro-Russian forces, they have such forces, boycott others, that is uh, this opposition bloc today in the parliament, and they want to, and they help this bloc very much by propaganda, by money, by hybrid war, by everything what Russia uh, is, is, is ready to use. And one day this group will win the election and the leaders of this new government will say, dear Ukrainians, please don't dream more. Our place is with our big brothers in, 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 in Russia. Don't uh, count on this... Uh, uh, Europe and this, this demoralized and, and, and lazy the European Union, which is not ready to help you, etc., etc. Today, this scenario is, is, is very unrealistic, the scenario to have such pro-Russian forces in, in Ukraine, but I think Russia will not resign of such politics of permanent destabilization of, um, uh, of Ukraine. Um, and of course, that is... That is the problem. If Russia will not change this politics towards Ukraine, it, it's very difficult to imagine even what kind of, of peace agreement we can have um, uh, with Russia. What can mitigate Russians and Putin in this situation? Of course, economic situation and sanctions, because in official propaganda of Russia, you have a lot of information that, uh, well, sanctions doesn't matter, even quite good, because we don't import some goods from Europe, but we produce these goods now, etc. But it's not true. If you see the economic figures, uh, the recession in Russia is a fact, uh, lower salaries is, is, is a fact, and um, um, uh, a very pessimistic perspective is a fact. And this situation was quite under control of Putin for a very, very long time, but I think no longer. I remember some a public opinion poll uh, two years ago, and the question, simply speaking, was, you are, do you think that economic situation in Russia will be better? 80% not. Do you expect that your salary will be higher? 80% not. Do you think that your kids will have a better future? 80% not. Do you accept politics of Putin and his economic program for Russia? 80% yes. Uh, but it was two years ago. Now, if you see last demonstration, if you see this movement of young people, not only in Moscow, but in many other cities of, of, of Russia, if you see, um, if you see also uh, this uh, reaction on this uh, reform of pensions, 
so the situation changed. What we know now, the rating of Putin is the lowest in the, in the, in the last years. And it's necessary to understand that each more layer of, uh, year of Putin will create such atmosphere of, of, of tiredness. Because, uh, you know, for young generation in, in Russia, Putin is from, from the very beginning, you know. He don't know, he don't know, um, uh, conclusion is coming, don't worry. So I, 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 know, I know what you want to do, you know. That, uh, no. uh, so that is, that is Russia. So, but this sanction, this economic situation can, can mitigate. Uh, and of course, I think if we will have a very, very strong position of the West and united position of the West from European Union and the United States about positive solution in, in Ukraine, it would be possible to, to achieve something. But unfortunately, especially from, from American side, we have uh, now a very special situation because, uh, frankly speaking, if you watch uh, American TV, we know very well that Ukraine is the most popular country here. Uh, Zelensky is the most popular politician here. And some um, Ukrainian companies are the most famous companies um, <laughs> uh, here. But this is not enough to have a good politics and to find um, uh, the solution. Ukraine. I think Ukraine, we have some... Uh, because now, especially here in Washington, everybody speaks about corruption in Ukraine, what is to some extent true, but it's not a 100% uh, truth about Ukraine. The Ukraine today is different, and I think everything what this new team of Zelensky and um, Honcharuk wants to do is, is very interesting. Um, yesterday, they, they had accepted in the parliament a very difficult uh, bill uh, of uh, land reform. Uh, they try to, to go um, uh, forward. Uh, they have chance and they have some um, problem because this is very young, very energetic team, but very inexperienced. And of course, because they are young and energetic, this is good because they are ready to do great things. But because inexperienced, that is easy to make a lot of mistakes and it's very easy to be instrumentalized by, uh, by Russians. But I think everything what is going now in, in Ukraine uh, is, is, is interesting and can go in, in the positive direction, in the sense of the fight against corruption, economic development, decentralization of the state, um, um, uh, create, uh, establishment of uh, really independent judiciary, etc. Uh, that is a huge package of, of, of um, uh, tasks, but it's, 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 they want to do it. I, I, I'm, uh, for me, this is, of course, very pleasant when the people compare Poland and Ukraine. And that's true, the, at the beginning of the transition, Poland and Ukraine, we had more or less GDP per capita the same. Today, Polish GDP per capita is four times bigger. And that is a nice compliment, but I'm very much against to compare fully Poland and Ukraine, because 70 years of the history as a Soviet Republic and 45 years Poland as a part of Soviet bloc, this is a different story. Poland was much more westernized from the very beginning. We had uh, private uh, farms, we had a private, small but private business, etc. And, and I think this credit of confidence and some support for Ukraine is very needed. And I'm very much afraid that because of such debates, what we can observe now in, in, in America, uh, this uh, next wind of opportunity can be uh, lost. And, and that would be, uh, would be uh, very, very dramatic. And last point is um, uh, this uh, Donetsk and Lugansk um, uh, problem. I think I spoke with uh, many of Ukrainian politicians and, and uh, uh, European politicians. This project of or this, this deal about uh, the solution for, for the conflict is theoretically quite, quite uh, simple. Because what we need for this um, um, uh, solution, first, withdrawal of, of Russian support for separatists. Support means money, uh, advisors, uh, propaganda, everything. Second, it's necessary to uh, have um, uh, to keep Donetsk and Lugansk as a part of, of Ukraine. This Ukrainian integrity should be uh, absolutely um, uh, uh, respected. Then, of course, it's necessary to find some kind of special, special status for this, uh, these um, uh, regions. But the problem is, is similar like in, in Russia. The decentralization or this uh, autonomy uh, should be very balanced with the necessity of integrity. 
because uh, in, in Ukraine, this uh, division line is not only between uh, east and west, it's also between south and, and north, big cities, small cities. So the fragmentation of this country is quite likely scenario. So the, the, if you want to say, OK, let's go with autonomy, I think today that's not the best example, like Catalonia, for example, <laughs> that, that we can have uh, more or less the same, the same problems like, like uh, Spain in Catalonia. This, this special, I, therefore, I'm speaking about special status and not, not uh, autonomy. Should be very, uh, very balanced. Then, of course, we need um, uh, very real perspective for Ukraine to be a member of the European Union, not yet, but in visible time. I think there's a question of next decade. Uh, for Poland, um, uh, we took 14 or 15 years from the beginning of our negotiations to the full membership. For Ukraine, probably this period can be even longer. Um, and um, uh, I think about NATO, that is open question, the most sensitive question. I understand that today to propose NATO membership for, Europe, for Ukraine, that is not possible. And it's necessary to find some different kind of guarantees for, for Ukraine. And with these guarantees, the West or the, the, the world has uh, a weak situation because we gave such guarantees for Ukraine during, uh, in this document, Budapest Memorandum, and we know what happened. So this is next point. And the last point is to organize international funds for um, um, uh, reconstruction of uh, not only Donetsk and Lugansk, but economic help for, for Ukraine. And I think this, uh, together with Russia, would be possible to, to, to organize such special funds. What is the problem? The problem is still the keys to solve the problem in Ukraine is in Ari and Kremlin. And if Putin is not interested to find such solution, we have no chances for that. What means, practically, that we will have a frozen conflict in Ukraine for the next many, many years. And frozen conflict is a problem for Ukraine, is a problem for us, but it's not a problem, big problem for, for Russia, because Russia is a good, probably the best specialist in frozen conflicts. If you see, if you see Nagorno-Karabakh, if you see Transnistria, if you see Ossetia today, uh, and, and, and Donetsk, Lugansk, you see that you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years of frozen conflict, that's, that's is, that is nothing. So I see some chances. I'm very much against isolation of Russia. I'm very much for dialogue with Russia. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, happy when I see some um, um, elements, instruments of such dialogue. But in this dialogue, we cannot be naive. And we should understand these strategic goals which Putin has, because if we know these goals, if we know the methods what Putin is using is easier to predict some consequences of our talks, of our decisions, etc. So, thank you for your attention, and I want to say that um, 60 years of series is a, is a good time. A lot changed during this period, not because of series only, but, uh, you know, Soviet Union doesn't exist, Warsaw Pact doesn't exist, Germany is united, so there's a long list of successes of series. Um, <laughs> And I promise to you that uh, your job, your, your activities in the coming years will be not boring because I am from such region of the world that we protect your, a lot of interest for your, for your job. Um, if you see what is going in Hungary, Poland and other countries, uh, I'm sure that if I will be enough in good shape, I will be here in the 70th anniversary to speak about something in, uh, from our region. So thank you very much again. Anyone, you obviously painted a very broad picture. Any questions from anyone? Thank you. Uh, I'm Harley Walzer, and it's lovely to see you again. Uh, I was intrigued by your comments about the change in America's attitude toward Europe because of the demographic shift. Uh, but is it one sided? <clears throat> Uh, you know, Europe has leaders in Hungary, in Poland, in Great Britain, who are very upset about immigration. And I would think that it's a much more serious problem when it comes from both sides. Well, yes, but uh, 
Uh, first of all, I'm sorry that I, I, I speak so, so uh, long, but uh, that is a real danger if you invite former president, he has more time as, a, as acting president, and maybe I, I misuse this, this, this opportunity, sorry. And the same with this question, you know, long story. Uh, first of all, the, this uh, time of such person like uh, Orban, Kaczynski, and uh, uh, Johnson, uh, others, Le Pen, etc., uh, that is very complicated to because it's connected with everything would change uh, now. Uh, in in uh, Georgetown last days, I said that you know do you remember such good slogan of uh, Clinton during his campaign? Economy stupid. If I would advise for some uh, new candidates, what should be such good slogan for now? Uh, is 21st century stupid, because really so many things changed so dramatically in this first. 21st century that is necessary to understand globalization, new technologies, migration, um, the climate, um, the economic crisis and consequences of this crisis, and what is very important as well, the crisis of this traditional democracy. And of course we have on this, because of all these reasons in many countries that is uh, depends, that is not the same model for each country, for example in Poland, uh, we can say that Polish election was, uh, some elements were similar to, to, to America, for example, Trump um, appealed very much to these frustrated people, Kaczynski as well in Poland to the people who were not beneficiaries of the transition period, but the losers. And to say, look, losers, I'm the man who will give you uh, something and you will be uh, proud again, etc. Et uh, in Poland, such important factor of the situation is the role of very conservative Catholic Church, what is not the fact in, in Hungary, for example. Uh, but of course, all these elements created some period of time when we have more space for populism, we have unfortunately more space for nationalism. Uh, in some countries, it's still not nationalism. Uh, because in Poland it's, it's not nationalism, but it's what I call it national egoism. But from national egoism to nationalism is not a very long way. So that is possible to change this uh, quite, quite uh, rapidly. So different. Still, I think that what we see now in, 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 in many countries is not end of the history, like Fukuyama said. That is an episode of the history. And the problem today is how much these pro-democratic forces, pro-European forces, pro, let's say, open borders forces will be strong to promote good politics and to win the elections. In democratic states, unfortunately, we have a problem with the leadership. That's the problem. That's the problem not in many countries, including, you know. Um, um, so, but, but in my opinion, this is an episode. The problem is not when it, uh, because we don't know when it will be finished. In my opinion, in Poland, that is no longer than next four years. Uh, the problem is about the costs, what price we will pay. And that is, that is the main question. Uh, then, of course, uh, migration issue. I think, finally, the European Union found uh, some good answer on the problem of migration. Because, first of all, migration is a not new phenomenon. Migration is from the beginning of mankind. Secondly, migration will be continued because we have from one side demographic boom in Africa and Asia and we have um, uh, aging societies in, in, in wealthy Europe. So we need migrants and we need migrants more, not less. But of course the question is how to keep border enough effective to control the situation and to eliminate the real crime, you know, organized crime, and human trafficking, etc. And how to accept and how to because that is not a good word, but it's not assimilation, but how to prepare some you know, rules of this uh, um, uh, common life between migrants and, and um, uh, hosts. You know, how to, and I tell you, if you would like to, 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 to ask me where in Europe we have positive example of this manageable migration, I can tell you, unfortunately, this is not European Union country, but this is Switzerland. In Switzerland, for a very, very long time, they have a lot of migrants, but they manage the situation quite, of course, the scale of the country is not very big, 8 million people, that is not America or, or Germany. But I think the migration is necessary to understand as a uh, permanent factor in, in, in our life, in our politics. 
And I think if we will uh, continue this politics, what we have now, including Germany, we have a chance to manage this problem of, of, of migration. But, but of course, nationalists will use it uh, uh, cynically this, uh, for for own uh, interest. Uh, I tell you, in the year 2015, Kaczynski used this uh, issue of migrants in Poland successfully because he won the election in the country where, in fact, we have no migrants. Of course, we have 1.5 million Ukrainians working in Poland, but it's difficult to, to call them um, uh, migrants. But well, that is a different story. So you know how the, the campaigns, political campaigns, looks now. That is that is really a different topic. But it, it looks terrible, in my opinion. Everything what and that is one of the main problems of, of traditional democracy. We have uh, we don't control really the um, uh, campaigns, uh, all these uh, processes, not only because, because of Russian influence, but also because of um, um, uh, fake news, because of the uh, role of PR companies. They create some enemies. So that, is, that is terrible. I'm very happy that I, I finished my political career, because today it would be, it would be difficult to, to, to go for some meetings and to lie and lie and lie and get lied. No, that is terrible. So. I think we have time for one more question. Here was a question, yes. <laughs> okay, well, please no join me in thanking President Kushner.